Hi everyone and welcome to our second lecture on continuous testing. Today we're going to focus on a particular type of testing which is regression testing. Uh, and I've got a concrete example, a case study here for you. Um, it's kind of tough sometimes to get these examples um, because you know it's you may not have the full information if it's an open source project, if it's a closed source people may not want to give it to you. So the example I have is actually something with a programming language interpreter called TXL. And it's from a while ago that I got from my former supervisor, Jim Cordy, and who was a professor, he's a professor emeritus at Queen's University. Um, and uh, this was some work that they were doing. Uh, they had a company where they were actually uh, maintaining TXL internal. It's still maintained now by him and uh, uh, several others, I believe. So we're going to look at that concrete example of regression testing. But before we do that, we're going to actually go through a little bit. I mentioned what regression testing is last time and talked about the purpose right before we ended. Today we're going to reiterate that and we're going to talk about how we actually go about doing regression testing and how we create and maintain a regression test set. So regression testing is basically all about testing your software over the lifetime of the software after it's already been deployed. And it's the idea is, is trying to make sure that the software behavior doesn't regress. It doesn't go back to a previous state where there were certain bugs or where there was um, be certain uh, abnormal behavior. Um, so the idea here is, is that it's going to try to ensure that the existing functionality and behavior aren't broken in new versions. So they basically we don't regress back. And it ensures that any changes in functionality are intended uh, that are intended are actually observed. And the idea is we want to catch any accidental or unintended changes that could lead to a bug uh, before it gets deployed and therefore reduce the costs associated with those changes. Um, and when we're talking about the method for regression testing, um, regression testing <coughs> is really designed around exhibiting the existing functionality and behavior. And so this is in some ways very similar to, you know, the requirements testing that we've talked about or functionality testing. That, those types of tests play a key role in this. So with regression testing, one of the things you want to do here is you want to choose a set of observable artifacts uh, that demonstrate aspects of the functionality and behavior of the software that you want to preserve or ensure are maintained. And you may notice here now, I'm no longer just talking about output anymore of the software. I'm talking about observable artifacts because in addition to making sure that requirements are satisfied, we may also have other uh, non-functional requirements that we want to make sure are preserved, such as performance, uh, memory usage, uh, CPU usage, that kind of thing. So we may want to observe um, some artifacts that are related to those non-functional properties as well. Uh, and what we want to do as well is we want to build up sort of a history or a record of these observable artifacts for every version of the software that we create and release. And we want to, as we do a new version of the software, we want to generate obser the observable artifacts for that version and compare them with the previous version to ensure the differences are intentional. So the idea here is, is that each new version is going to be compared to the previous one. And if you want to, you can kind of think about this idea. It's very similar to like the induction proofs that you may have seen in a course like a discrete math course in university. Um, and typically, this process of going sort of from the originally deployed software system to the new version, comparing the new version with the original, the next version with the previous, the next version with the previous, and so on, this is actually called a regression series. And the reason it's a series is because we're incrementally comparing the results of each new version with the previous one, which has already been compared to the previous one, which was already compared to the previous one all the way back to the original. Uh, and it's sort of that idea of the inductive proof uh, that's sort of similar here. Um, just remember, if you do have any questions, feel free to ask either in the chat or you can turn on your mic as well. So that's what we've talked about is a regression series. So another thing to think about as well, which is another type of regression series, is uh, we can think about is uh, actually the maintenance of our test suite. So we're talking, the one we just looked at was the maintenance of our software system. 
we're also talking about the maintenance of the test suite. So one of the things is if we're continuously doing testing every time we release a version, um, it's ideal that we have, uh, especially when we're doing agile methods with uh, frequent releases, um, it's important that the number of tests we have is at a practical level, is not too high, and uh, that we actually try to keep them in check so that way uh, the build times don't become uh, unwieldy. Um, so what we want to be constantly doing as we add new functionality to the software is we want to replace old tests. Uh, if, say, for example, we update it functionality, we want to replace the old tests with new ones that cover the same cases, but are, include the new functionality or the modified changed functionality. And the sequence of replacing tests that covered previous tests, that potentially covered previous tests and so on, can be also thought of as another type of regression series, only one of test suites in this case, or test cases. Um, and the reasoning behind this is that we don't want to lose anything when we're doing testing. So that means that it's always the case that our new tests are going to cover retired old tests, which in turn will cover previous retired old tests, and so on back to the originally validated test suite that we created when we first deployed the software, or even earlier than that when we were doing development. So it's this idea uh, here, we're maintaining the test suite as a regression series in the same way we're doing the testing of the software as a, a regression series. Okay, so the very fundamental idea here is when you're doing, remember we're talking about observable artifacts, so one of the very important things is we want this to be automated type of testing typically. Uh, and what I mean by automated is we want to have an automated way to assess if there are changes in observable artifacts when we run our test suite. And uh, in order to do that, we need to establish a baseline. And the baseline, we first off, we need to do is before we sort of establish what the baseline of the outputs are, the observable artifacts, we have to establish what the tests are that are going to be used in our regression testing. And typically, we use the three types of tests that we talked about last class, which are the original functionality test suite that was used during development, uh, the failure test, if any, that we have, as well as the, the first operational test. And remember, we talked about last time about maintaining all three of these types of tests. So this set, these three types of tests, they form the initial test suite that we will use for regression testing. And the very first thing we want to do is we want to validate that they all run correctly. And then once we choose our observable set of artifacts to be tracked, what we want to do then is we want to run our test suite and capture these observable artifacts and save them. And that's going to be our baseline. That, so this very first, for, this is for the version we've, we've already tested and deployed. We're going to take these tests, assuming we're assuming here all of our tests pass, we're going to take the values, the outputs of the tests, all of the non-functional properties we capture and so on, and we're going to actually save them as our baseline. And when we do the next version of the software, we're going to compare its outputs to the ones that we just saved as our baseline. And so this is really important here, because what we don't want to do is have to manually create all of our tests outputs from scratch. But if we have uh, if we take the existing test suite, we take the software which has been rigorously tested before deployment, and before we make any further changes, we use those values as the baseline, we're in pretty good shape to be able to automate this. Okay, so that's the baseline, and I mentioned already as well that we're going to want to add and re retire tests as we go. Uh, and that means primarily that when functionality is added, we have to add and validate new tests. What do I mean by validate? Validate means I actually want to, when I add in the test, I run the test, and I need to, um, first off, I need to validate that the values that I'm getting are correct for that test in terms of outputs, and I need to capture a baseline for the observable artifacts for those tests. Um, now, anything, any uh, functionality that's changed, I need to add new tests and re retire the tests that are being replaced and do the same process of validating. Uh, and any time that I retire, fail retire tests, like for example, retiring failure tests that have 
uh, not been exhibited, for example, in two years or something, I need to also, um, when I'm doing that, when I retire them, then I'm going to, those, while I have, I'm not going to be comparing results for those tests with the old ones. So those will just, they will not be captured in the next version of the software. Um, and that's pretty much what I'm looking at. Operational tests also need to be maintained, retired, and replaced when the operational use of the software changes. And I suggested last time maybe a, a good kind of uh, uh, a rule or a good sort of guideline to think about with this is with operational tests is whenever you make major functionality changes, that's typically when you may, or user interface changes, that's when you'll see operational changes. When you change how the software is utilized in terms of its interface and what the software is capable of in terms of its functionality. Those types of changes typically happen at major releases. Uh, and so major releases are always a good point uh, at a minimum to be thinking about maintaining your operational tests. So, and it's important to remember, we're always maintaining the tests here because as a software ages, test suites grow. So we want to retire the tests so that we end up with a reasonable number of tests and so that our, the time it takes to do our build and test doesn't become uh, onerous. Now, what are some examples of observable artifacts? Anyone have any ideas? The UML diagrams? Well, that wouldn't be. Observable artifacts are artifacts that are observable from running our tests with our software. So things that are generated or speed. Okay, what do you mean by speed? Well, it depends, right, on the software system. So um, it could be speed in terms of how long it takes to complete each test. So we may actually just look at the real time. Uh, we could look at hardware load, yeah, the CPU usage, the memory usage. Uh, if this is a networked application, uh, we could look at uh, the amount of data that's being processed per at, a, at a, the rate of processing of data that's coming in and out, especially if it's something real time or if it's, for example, processing streaming video, that kind of thing. We could look at that. Um, we could also, if we're dealing with something command line, for example, a lot of the command line tools allow you to have uh, verbose modes. So you can run them in verbose where they give you more detailed output. So we could actually choose to, when available, run the software either in a verbose mode or with, um, for example, assertions turned on or uh, debugging information being logged and then we have a, a debugging log which we can uh, you know for example then actually evaluate as well so output that isn't normally generated by the tests if you just run it in the standard mode but additional outputs that we could get about the internal working so these are all kinds of things log files are a very popular one as I mentioned uh, any others memory usage yep so that was one that we taught, yeah, memory usage, CPU usage, uh, network bandwidth. There's all kinds of things that we could look at here. Um, it just really, some of it is very dependent on the software and the purpose and so on. Um, it could be not just CPU usage in terms of percentage, it could be number of CPUs utilized if you're talking about a parallel program. And the output, of course, is also key, right? And that's both the output in terms of the standard output uh, as well as any debugging or verbose output or or whatnot assertion violations different things logs files that stuff so um, here's a list of some things we can think about so observable artifacts they can include um, the direct outputs of the software system as well as other indicators of behavior so um, those could include command line input and output, um, file streaming, streams of output or input, 
uh, network output. It could be if it's an application that's connected uh, wirelessly to different devices. It can be the data transmitted between those devices in this uh, application. Uh, and it takes all of them together as observable artifacts, all of these different outputs of the software. Um, it could also include uh, outputs that aren't immediately visible, typically, uh, by turning on, as I mentioned, instrumentation flags, debugging, verbose, tracing, and so on and so forth. Um, those could also be things as well. Um, so you can get all of the standard outputs plus all of the additional outputs that are possible when running it in other modes, such as a debugging or instrumentation mode or with assertions on, that kind of thing. Um, in addition to those direct outputs, you also might be interested in performance, as was mentioned uh, by some of the students in the class. Um, and this measures both time and space often, right? Um, so, uh, for example, if it's a command line, we could use something like the Unix time command to actually... Uh, measure the time we have and that and the time command can allow us to capture both the real time as well as the CPU time uh, by looking at both the system and user time here um, and then um, the other thing is is that uh, in addition to the time you could also look at monitor CPU usage for uh, the application and that kind of thing as well um, and Basically, what we want to do here is we want to capture all of these observable artifacts and then we want to be able to compare them, right? So we compare the current version to the previous version. And that comparison, we the simplest way is to do like a diff if we can. So ideally, we'd like to be able to take all of these observable artifacts and translate them into text if possible because um, that's much easier to work with. Now, that's not always possible depending on if it's a video-based application or a game. That's this may not be as, as easy to do. So, um, but, you know, this is sort of, you know, what's ideal. If we're dealing with other types of applications, we may have to modify our process. Um, okay, so uh, that's a little bit there uh, about uh, choosing the artifacts, but we also need to maintain them and difference them and, and make them archival. So the idea here is what we want to do is we're going to have all the different types of outputs and the different behavioral information that we can capture from uh, doing different types of monitoring of the software as it's running. Um, so what we want to do here is we want to combine all of these observable artifacts. We often want to do this is combine them all into a single file if we can. So it's sort of a big behavioral profile or signature. So what we do is if we can take all of the different types of outputs and information we're collecting and we can put them into a file in the same sequence, right? So our output information is first, then our debugging information, then any time space stats and so on. If we concatenate them all together in the same order each time, this would then allow us to diff those two behavioral signatures and see if there's any differences. Okay. Make sense? Now, it probably makes sense, especially for things like comparing the outputs, right? But we also know that if we're comparing things like, for example, time and space dots, the timing information may vary slightly from run to run, even when you use the same software, sorry, same test values. So one of the things you also have to think about when we're doing this is, is there are going to be cases where we're going to find differences that aren't really super critical, so especially in the behavioral profile. So I'll talk about how we address that later. And there are ways you can do it automatically, and there are also ways you can do it manually as well. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So um, here's just one example, right? So if we have, and this is using, and this is something that you probably are going to want to use if you're in your course project as well for the command line uh, testing that you're doing. Um, that typically uh, what you want to do is you want to compare the new version with the previous version. So you want to compare the new signature file and the old one. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing the, if you're doing it at the command line, now you may have in-house tools that do this automatically and generate a much nicer view. 
Uh, but what you're seeing here is you're seeing the just doing it with the Unix diff command and text files, right? Um, one of the reasons the benefits of doing things command line is it's automated. It's it's really easy to automate. Uh, another thing is is it doesn't have a lot of overhead associated with it, so it can be usually pretty quick. Um, so if we're diffing these, what you're basically seeing here is you're seeing um, in the first case it's comparing lines uh, 314 to 314. Okay. And uh, what it's telling you basically is that, that those two lines are different. So this is actually time information and memory usage. So the time information is the user and system that combined together give you the CPU time. So you can see here that the timing information is slightly different. It's went from 0.3 to 0.7. Uh, and then you can also see there's some slight differences in the amount of memory in terms of the amount of, uh, that's used here. Now, those maybe aren't significant, so you may just decide to ignore those. The next thing you'll see here is it's comparing line 2721 with 2721 and 2722. And what you can see here is that instead of getting the end of run goodbye, it actually got an error invalid command create end of run goodbye. So the output line was different there. So this is actually something where the, the output of the program is different. So this might be something that's much more critical. Uh, but this is the kind of thing where if you see a difference in output, it's almost always the result of either a problem with your test or a problem with your software. If you see a, uh, a difference that's a result of performance information, you have to look at that performance information typically and decide, is this a significant difference that we should be concerned? Or is this within sort of the normal deviations we'll see depending on uh, the system we're running on and so forth? Okay, um, so the other thing that we also want to do is, and this is where the automation comes in, is that it's often really useful to normalize the signatures. And what I mean by that is, is to allow it to be the differencing to be more automated. Um, any irrelevant or, or intentional differences between the versions, we factor them out. Okay, um, for example, let's say we had, um, well, actually, I have an example coming up right here. Um, uh, but we can, and, and also the normalization can happen automatically as well. And we can use the normalization uh, to remove any intentional changes, for example, to the output. So the example I have here is what about if the previous software did all its output in, in uppercase and then we switched to mixed case, right? Well, if that's what we're doing, then what we would probably want to do is we want to normalize the two, both the new version and old version, to use the same case when we do the diff. Okay, um, so that's something we would want to do. So either switch the new one to also be uppercase for the, just for the purposes of the diff, make a copy that's uppercase, that's a normalized version, and then the next time we do it, we can just use the mixed case because we can use the original mixed one. Um, the other thing that we can also do is use that to normalize um, information about... Um, so we, right here, it's, I'm mainly talking about uh, eliminating non-behavioral or intended differences. But you can also do it a little bit with behavioral sometimes too. Uh, but that's a little trickier because what you would have to do, if we go back to this version, for example, before, right, what you could actually do is you could do things such as deciding what's a normal range of values for time. And so rather than report the exact time as 0.3 or 0.7, you could normalize the time if it's in a certain range as being, uh, you know, low, medium, high, or something like that, where you map specific values to a more general value. You lose precision information there, and then you have to go back to the originals to see it. But that can sometimes be a way of, of allowing you to um, address issues that are minor. Um, so, for example, one thing you could do here is you may say, you know what? I'm not too worried about point whatever, uh, you know, in terms of the, the time here. So I'm only going to, I'm going to truncate at the decimal place for time. So zero, so that means that the user times just become, if I truncate, zero, zero. So now they're the same. If I just cut off the point three and the point seven and say, I don't need to be that precise. So you could reduce some of the precision to reduce some of the, the common sort of noise that you might get from run to run. Um, although I... Doing the behavior stuff automatically by through normalization is tricky, and I 
only would recommend it in cases where you have a there's a well understood um, you have a well understood um, knowledge I guess about what behavior is acceptable and what behavior is not and if you if you know if if you're not at all sure if it's if it's appropriate to do it's best not to and to look at these manually until at least you get a more of a handle on what you're sort of looking for in terms of good and bad um, differences in terms of the behavior. Okay. Oh, uh, another example of normalizing that sometimes you also have to do, um, this is kind of a neat example. It's something I've done when I've been doing testing with um, concurrent software. It's often with something like concurrent software, if you have non-determinism, uh, meaning you have randomness in the output. So different threads can output information at different times. So the output is all the same. It's just the timing of it can vary. So the order can vary. And if you want to automate uh, comparing outputs with like parallel programs or concurrent programs, one of the ways you can normalize it is by normalizing it by uh, doing things like sorting. If you know that the programs output things on a line by line level, you can sort the outputs alphabetically and then you remove differences in terms of the the ordering because of how the threads have been scheduled so there's there's all kinds of times where you may want to normalize stuff for testing so it's something that is is used regularly i i would say and you should keep it in mind um okay so um, we've already talked about we established the baseline as the original version which is the version when we run our tests the first time on the the released version um, that version it can be really helpful like I said to run it on that first version of the software that we've deployed that we've already gone through and rigorously tested and made sure it passes all the tests we still though want to look at the, because we're combining new information often so the behavior base the signature includes not just outputs but other information that very first version our baseline we do want to go through that by hand. We want to look through that and make sure we have a really good understanding about what all the outputs are and if they make sense because everything we're going to be doing later uh, is going to be looking at differencing and our assumption is going to be that that baseline is correct. So we want to make sure that that's true. So you do more work up front by looking at the baseline and having to by hand evaluate it and examine it and then you can get more automation. So the longer over time you do regression testing, the more benefit that that initial manual inspection of the baseline signature pays off. Um, and the other thing you'll want to do often in this case is have a test harness. Um, so this is the procedure for automatically running, collecting uh, the observable artifacts and differencing them and producing a report. Um, some there's some companies have use third party tools to essentially do test harnesses and automate testing process. Uh, some have custom in house solutions. Um, other times you have to sort of do it yourself. Uh, in our course project, we're sort of going to be doing a little bit of both. The current phase we're doing, we're doing uh, essentially scripting, we're automating it with Unix scripts. Uh, and then in a later phase of the project, we're going to actually be doing some testing where we're going to use a third party testing tool, which will allow us to do automation of running our tests and that. So um, in general here, you need to have some way of automating the tests, running them, recording the outputs and the observable artifacts and comparing them with the previous version. Okay, and here's our example. So the example we're going to be doing and I'm looking at it, it's one that this is actually the TXL interpreter, which is um, it's actually a software product or tool that implements a programming language called TXL. And TXL is a great language. I actually use this in the research lab that I have. Um, it's actually used around the world. It's been used in commercial applications as well to do to solve problems, um, including, for example, um, addressing the Y2K uh, bugs automatically. Um, so this is something that has been around for since the... I think it was early 90s it was uh, first developed and uh, it's been around for a while and TXL interpreter is it it actually takes in as input TXL programs and interprets them um, so it takes in this TXL program which contain a whole bunch of rules about 
uh, how to transform some sort of um, source file. And TXL is a, it's not, it is actually a transformation language. So it contains a lot of by example rules for how you actually convert or how you actually analyze a particular software or, or source code file. So for example, um, TXL, you might write a TXL program that takes in uh, a C file and converts it into a Java file. You could take another uh, TXL program that takes in a C file with, um, well, let's say, or it takes, yeah, it takes in a C file with a switch statement and converts the switch statements to uh, if else. If you decide you didn't want switch statements, whatever it is. I've used it as well to do automation of mutation testing. It's been used to do clone detection. Um, it's been used in a wide variety of, of different areas and with a wide variety of different programming languages. So that's really all you need to know about it. But what it basically does is it takes as input the TXL program, which is the code you write in TXL, which is a set of rules for how to transform one program into some other version. It takes as an input file a source code file, so a C file, or if it was the, the language foo, it would take in bar.foo. And it compiles it and runs the program on the input. <coughs> um, it also usually takes in as well a grammar file, um, which or, or use, utilizes, I should say, a grammar file uh, to understand how to read in that input. Um, and once it actually takes in as input as, uh, the input file and the TXL program, it produces two types of outputs on two different streams. It can produce more, but the, the two main ones are there's an output stream, which is the output of the program. That's the, that goes to standard output. Um, and compiler and runtime error messages, those go to the standard error stream. Um, you can also, from this as well, um, have it write to files and things as well. Um, so it has mainly these two types of streams, the output stream and the error stream data. And uh, when TXL... Uh, is TXL is actually, like I said, it's been used both in research and commercially. And um, when it was being used commercially in particular, uh, there were a lot of regression tests that were set up for it. Uh, and the regression tests, um, as I understand it from, uh, from Jim Cordy, uh, were largely done as, or they were organized into one large directory where every subdirectory contained tests. And the test cases were named uh, in ways that gave you information about whether or not they were functionality tests, failure tests, or operational. And the test directories all contained the test inputs, uh, as well as uh, a readme file explaining the purpose of those tests and the intent. So um, here's an example here. Um, as you can see here, uh, the top part is the directory structure of a snippet of uh, the regression test suite. Um, things like ASDT and Abacus, those would be considered operational tests. Something like AND condition would be a functional test. And then failure tests would be labeled similar to April 97 bugs. So you have a mix here of operational tests, functional tests, and failure tests. And if we go into one of these directories, like the Abacus uh, directory here, and we look, inside this are a readme file explaining the purpose intent of this, as well as uh, three example files here. And remember, if we go back, uh, we said that uh, there are a number of test inputs, each beginning with the letter EG. A and that's what we're seeing here, eg.compound, eg1.cascade, eg2.cascade. Okay, uh, and then there's an output file here, and we'll get to that. And, um, and then if there's any uh, supplementary information that's needed, uh, you can store that potentially in the, it could be in the TXL directory, for example, as well. So um, here's an example of a C script, a C shell harness that you could use uh, for uh, running the TXL regression tests. And basically what this does is if you want to read through it is the for each loop actually will go through each test case directory. 
uh, it will actually go through each item in the parent directory. If it's a directory, then it will echo out a message, say, which is a separator, saying what directory it's now focused on. Uh, it will then change directory to that directory. Uh, it will then, for every J that starts with eg star dot star, that means every input file in the directory, it's going to run the new version of TXL with that input. And it's also going to do two things. If you notice, it has it's going to run the time command before it. So time will allow us to get the information about uh, the, C the CPU in real time as well as some memory information. Um, it will run the new TXL and it will run it in dash V which is turn on the verbose and diagnostic messages so we can capture those. So that's how we'll run it. We'll do this for every test file in the directory. Then we'll back out of the directory. We'll go to the next directory and we will do the same process again and we'll be finished when every directory, uh, every test case directory in the parent directory has had all of the input test cases executed. Make sense? Okay, uh, then the next thing we're gonna do is, uh, which I wanna sort of show you is that if you look at it, this is the script called new test all. Okay, this is going to test everything. So when we run this script at command line, here's what we're going to do. We're going to basically run this and we're going to capture all of the different output streams and store them into one file. So that that angle bracket followed by the ampersand will allow us to get both the output and error streams and we'll save them into the file NTA out 2.42. So it puts all direct and diagnostic output into the signature file automatically, okay? And then what we will do is once we've ran all the tests, captured them, put them all in the signature file, we will then diff the signature file from the previous version, version 2.41 with 2.42 and see if our software has regressed, if it has any unintended behaviors or errors that we haven't expected. So if we want to go in here and look at what is in this signature file, this is an example. So this also captures all the information, those, those messages that we had displayed to the screen, like the, the equals equals, and we had to display the name of the directory, like Abacus, we can see those messages show up here. Um, what also shows up in here, I believe as well, is the time information from the time command shows up at the end. Um, and basically, this will then allow us, and it, it's important to do this where we actually display the test information into this file, um, because this will give us context. If we don't put anything in there about which test we're running at every time, if we find a mistake, how do we know what output that was from? So we really, it's sort of like in some ways, it's good documentation of your behavioral signature files um, to actually include information about each test that's being run and so on so that you can clearly, when you find an issue, go back and know exactly what you ran to get that uh, unexpected output. Okay. So what we're seeing here, basically, if we want to look at this, is we're seeing that um, if you kind of go and look here, um, we can see this is the right up here is the test directory. Then we start seeing the messages coming out of the TXL program itself. And all of this information such as verbose TXL, bootstrapping TXL used, this many trees and kids, this information is verbose mode. Because what TXL does is it actually generates um, uh, abstract syntax trees 
uh, and that's the representation it uses uh, for the programs, the source code. So it's giving you information about uh, the internal workings in terms of how much internal, uh, I guess you could think of it as data structure or, re or it's using uh, when it's doing this. Um, things like parsing TXL program, um, that is a little bit more of a general statement. So that wouldn't be part of the ver verbose or diagnostic, but you get to see the sort of internal information here. Um, and then what you get down here in the blue, this is actually the standard output. This is what TXL normally would generate from running this program. It will give you a whole bunch of these lists of statements here. And these are the direct outputs of the test run. And then at the very end, because we ran that time command, um, we actually um, ended up uh, getting this as well in our signature file, which is for this given test, it took 0, 0.0 seconds basically. So the it took so little time that it wasn't captured at that at this level of granularity. And you also see some stuff with the memory here. Now, um, if we go a little further um, and look at the differencing between the two versions, we'll get for every line, like line two here, we can see this gave us that TXL and TXL. These lines are different, but wait a sec. This is just differences in the version information, the dates they were released and the actual version numbers. This isn't really useful data. This doesn't mean anything in terms of the testing. We then can go and see, hey, there's a slight difference in performance data right here. But then if we go and look at it, this isn't really substantial. So maybe we wouldn't be too bothered by that either. And if we keep going down, most of these are the version information as well as the time information. So it may be a useful practice in this case to, if we actually normalize this by removing the actual version detail from the files, if it wasn't too much trouble, because then it would save us on a lot of the output that's unnecessary. Now, if we keep going further in our differencing though, we can find some issues. For example, here's, a ma here's something that was output uh, I think this uh, was by the was part of the verbose output, but it says preprocessor directives 58, and then it says preprocessor directives 58, but they're different. Why are they different? Because the spacing is different. This one has an extra space, and you might say big deal, but that's actually a change in the output, and that actually technically is a bug. It's it turns out it's it's not a big deal, but in terms of bugs, it's not a super big deal, but it is still a bug. We also can see here that um, there's actually been a significant difference in the performance here, right? Um, you know, in terms of the percentage. And we might say, well, oh, that's an issue. But the good thing is, you got to remember, is the first line is the old version. Second line is the new version. And the new version values are actually less. So there's a performance difference, but it's went down. So the actual new version is actually faster. That's good, right? So this is okay. Uh, and then here's something else where you may see that there's some, this, the old version had two more trees than this one. And this is some of the internal diagnostic differences. And depending on your knowledge about this, and usually the tester would have knowledge about this, this may or may not be a big deal. Um, if the reason you decide if it's a big deal is if this is something that isn't supposed to vary from execution to execution, then this is problematic. Um, but if this is something that actually, see here how this went down by two, maybe this actually could be related to the timing because maybe there were some internal optimizations where they've reduced the number of trees that were needed. And so this could be the result of a performance optimization. So if you know and you were expecting a difference here because of an optimization, this is great, it confirms it. Um, if this wasn't the result of, and this was unintended, then you should look into it further to make sure that it isn't uh, a sign of something that might actually end up as a spurious result or a, an incorrect result uh, for the user. So uh, that sort of kind of covers, I guess, to a certain extent, the case study and the example I wanted to talk to you about. Um, before we go, I did want to just quickly wrap up with what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of 
regression testing. Um, and namely, uh, if we want, we can think about uh, advantages here are that it can make sure that any functionality that we had before doesn't never get accidentally lost, right? If we accidentally remove functionality, we're going to have a test that fails. Um, so this is good. Um, it also ensures, because we keep these failure tests around, it can, we can ensure that previously fixed bugs don't reappear. We can also ensure that all accidental bugs are caught because we have the this robust set of functionality tests and operational tests as well um, as well as the failure tests, which can help us identify fixed bugs reappearing. Um, and we can also ensure that there are virtually no unintended changes in the behavior. Um, and that's because we're actually monitoring the behavior. We're recording things such as the memory usage, the, the, the time, the speed, that kind of thing. Um, and, um, you know, in general, software that utilizes regression testing uh, is usually thought to have a high level of quality and, and end up with a high level of user observable quality. Now, what are the disadvantages? Well, <clears throat> disadvantages are, some of them are, I, I don't know if they're disadvantages so much as um, they're the trade-offs for actually doing it. Uh, but in general, the regression set of tests has to be maintained as well as while you're maintaining the software. And that can actually be work. And if you're uh, in an environment where there isn't, it's a little more ad hoc, there isn't the discipline and care in maintaining the tests, you may see degraded performance over time as your test suite grows or as potentially if the test suite isn't maintained and new tests aren't added as new functionality, you'll see gaps between uh, what's in the software and what it's testing for, which means bugs can slip through. Um, so this is one of those things where, you know, it's your regression testing is only as good as, the, as how well you maintain your test suite. Um, the other thing is that um, there's significant upfront effort required when b establishing the baseline, which has to be manually evaluated, and building the test harness to do the automated part of the testing. Uh, both of these take time. Um, they pay off later, especially over the lifetime of longer of products that stay around longer. But if your product isn't going to be used for an extended period of time, these may not seem worth it uh, to some. Um, so it, it's one of those things where it pays more and more dividends the longer your software will be uh, deployed and maintained. Um, so the bottom line about regression testing was basically... Regression testing is, is a fairly standard uh, practice in companies uh, in, in the software industry. Um, it's not something that people just say, I'm going to skip. It's typically something that every high quality software shop is going to do. Uh, and there's a track record of success of using this uh, in practice. So, um, you know, this is something that's important for you to understand and know because most likely wherever you end up getting a job, uh, if you're doing any development as part of that job, you'll end up uh, having some experience with regression testing. Okay, so in summary, uh, what we've done today is we've actually done uh, an overview of regression testing, both how we actually set it up, how we maintain it, and we've talked about... Um, how regression testing works in practice by actually going through an example of the TXL interpreter and regression testing with that. Um, we also talked about the importance of maintaining the regression set of tests, uh, which include functionality tests as well as um, operational tests and failure tests. And we also talked about uh, the importance of not just comparing outputs of software, but all observable artifacts that are relevant. And these can capture both functional and non-functional aspects of the software that you want to make sure um, you have an understanding of and want to make sure that you are aware of any changes to. Okay, so that concludes the lecture. Thank you all very much uh, and have a good evening.